This is Reddit Horror Stories, where we rip the veil off the darkest human experiences. Here, you'll encounter explicit tales of horror that delve into the grotesque and the obscene. From chilling encounters to disturbing narratives, this is a no-holds-barred descent into the macabre. Prepare yourself for raw, unfiltered terror that will haunt your very soul. In the spring of 2016, I was a lonely 16-year-old who spent a lot of time playing computer games. I joined a small Minecraft server and eventually became a moderator. During this time, I met Jay, a troubled player who became obsessed with me, and Z, a senior staff member who initially humiliated me, but later developed a strange friendship with me. Our friendship began with a comic feud, which led to us chatting outside the game. Z was knowledgeable in IT, and I consulted him on career-related topics. In January 2017, Z and several senior administrators resigned, leading to the server's closure. Despite this, my connection with Z remained, and Jay continued to stalk my online accounts. In March 2017, I started playing another voxel game on an RP server, where I created an alter ego. Z found out and joined the game, and we started chatting more frequently. Z was two years older than me, and had a charming troll-like communication style. Our conversations often took unexpected turns, and Z would sometimes behave like a wise older sibling or a naive younger one. As time went on, I became more attached to Z, often staying up late to chat with him. In July, I developed an addiction to opening cases in an online shooter, and I asked Z for money, which he refused. By June, I decided to sell some virtual game items for money, but was deceived by Z, who stole the items and banned his account. This was the first time I saw Z's malicious side. I blocked Z, but eventually unblocked him because I was lonely. Our chats resumed, and Z began to behave more aggressively, hitting my emotional weak spots. Despite this, I became even more attached to him, leading to another humiliating moment when I jokingly asked if he could be my girlfriend, which he declined. In late 2017, Jay continued to harass me, and Z doxed her, revealing sensitive information about her. In response, I stupidly revealed that Jay lived in my city, this led to Jay stalking me in real life, which terrified me. Z found it amusing and continued to manipulate and control me. In 2018, Z sent my childhood photos and personal information about my family, showing that he had access to my life. I felt his control and was scared, but didn't want to show weakness. Z's behavior escalated, and he even suggested harming Jay. I finally told my girlfriend everything, and we decided to block Z, which surprisingly ended the harassment. Years later, Jay contacted me, apologizing for her actions and revealing that she had received help. I still sometimes revisit my old chats with Z, feeling a mix of nostalgia and fear. Sorry for my bad grammar. I'm not great at writing but I wanted to share my story. About a year ago when I was 19, I lived in a small house with my single mother. My mom is a very bubbly woman who can start a conversation with anyone and is loved by everyone. One morning I heard her talking to someone outside my bedroom window. Shrugging it off, I eventually went downstairs to ask who she was talking to. She explained she was talking to our new neighbor, an old priest around 95 years old who lived alone. A nurse visited him a few times a month, and he had no family members as they had all passed away. A few weeks went by and my mum, being the kind woman she is, cut our neighbour's grass and often chatted with him out of pity. I never saw this man myself, only hearing about him from my mum's daily ramblings. Our house had a window at the top of the stairs that faced the priest's house. The houses were almost identical, with a window facing ours, Again, I never saw him, only the dim landing light in his house. About three months later, one night I'll never forget, around 1am, I went downstairs to get something to eat. On my way back up the stairs to my bedroom, 
I instinctively looked out the landing window. There, on the opposite side, was the old man, gripping the banister as he helped himself up the stairs. The lighting was terrible, but I could see he was very skinny, like many elderly people. Nosy, I stood there for a moment, trying to get a good look at him. He was hunched over, struggling to carry his own body weight, and I could see the ridges of his spine through his shirt as he hobbled out of view. This freaked me out, and I immediately went to my room, trying to get that disturbing image out of my head before I slept. A week or two later, the priest nurse showed up at our door, asking if we'd seen him recently. She was unable to get into his house as it was completely locked and sealed. She hadn't heard from him in over four months and was concerned for his well-being. I wasn't home to tell her I'd seen him in the window as I was at school, so my mother just said she hadn't heard from him either. The nurse called the police who broke down his door. I was walking home as they reached my house. The police were giving another blow at the door with some kind of battering ram. When the door finally came down, the smell that left the house could make anyone's toes curl. It was like when your cat brings home a mouse and it dies under your couch without you knowing. Rushing inside, I immediately went up to my room and peered out my bedroom window, watching the police enter his house, covering their noses. I don't really remember what happened after that, except when they wheeled his body out in a black bag and into the back of a black van. It was sad. I'd never gotten to speak to him and felt guilty for being so horrified by his appearance. My mum was also distraught by his passing and was talking to the police outside. The house took weeks to be cleaned because when he died, all the windows and doors were shut, keeping the smell locked in. When the police left and the street went silent again, I found myself spending more time with my mum downstairs. She has always been religious, so as we spoke she lit a candle for him out of respect and to help him pass into heaven. Bringing up the putrid smell, I asked her what the police told her. What she told me has stuck with me since that day. They said he died a few months ago and had been found decomposing in his bed. At first I just shrugged this off when she spoke. Yes, it was disturbing, but more sad that nobody had noticed his disappearance. But then it clicked. If he died a few months ago, who was it that I saw through the window? I mentioned this to my mom. She knew I had never seen or spoken to him while he was alive, so she asked me what he looked like. I described his wispy white hair and bony hunch. I still remember her face turning from a blush pink to a pale white. We moved out a month later. I woke up the other morning pretty pissed off. A letter about code enforcement from the county complained about my yard. The land has grown steep in parts, and in my attempt to mitigate the damage done by previous owners, I ended up with a mound of debris that likes to grow weeds as well. I called them. They said to take down the weeds, and they would work with me on the debris. I cannot seem to keep a string trimmer. I am less affluent than my neighbors and can only seem to afford weaker electric ones and their batteries or really any part of them dies within the year. So I decided to look into unconventional methods and found how I might take up scything. I did a lot of research and romanticized the idea of restoring a 100-year-old American scythe like the men doing so on YouTube. I immediately, late at night, searched up anybody selling some locally on FB Marketplace. A man was selling two, for very cheap, very nearby. I messaged him and worked out the purchase. I fell asleep thinking of restoring the old instrument. I felt calm. In my dream, I was bowing before three figures. One, a female who was peeling a fruit that looked like a honeycomb full of red droplets of blood. One, a naked male with what looked like a Viking helmet and a long golden horn in one hand. The last figure I could not make out, just a scruffy, charcoal-like image on the edge of a shadow. I wept when I saw the second figure, begging him to interject on my behalf. I seemed to have entered the dream mid-conversation. The two other figures looked to him, the woman looking at me with an almost doting expression of pity. 
The shadowy figure seemed to be whispering to them both in a language I did not know. Both the helmeted man and the woman nodded to it. The woman looked at me with a charitable sort of smile. You will have to give some token of your appreciation later, she said. Then there was a conversation I still do not remember and I woke up. I forgot the dream. I am 34. I have several children. My two older kids wanted to go get the size with me. We hopped in the car and I drove around getting tools to use in the restoration. The man lived in a remote part of the next county over. It took a while to find his house. He was waiting in his driveway. When I pulled up, I immediately started feeling dread. I couldn't figure out why. He seemed like a nice guy. Yet I felt something was off. I did some meditative breathing and calmed down. I got out. He told me where he got them and we talked a little. As soon as I picked up and held one, I felt a brief moment of shock in my legs and arms. I insisted on ignoring the stupid feelings. I dismissed it as me being reclusive and not feeling social today. After putting the scythes in the hatch of the van, I came around to the driver's side and stopped dead. The man was standing there with a piece of paper in his hand. It was a million dollar question, he said. It was some kind of religious pamphlet on a fake million dollar bill. The man talked for a moment about death, about how we aren't going to be here forever, and about how Jesus Christ is the only thing that will keep our souls from going to hell. The whole thing redoubled the dread I felt. I was very polite and talked my way back into my car, feeling the dread mount more and more as I drove. We stopped at a light after an on-ramp. I was coming off an interstate, turning left onto an intersecting highway. I tried to breathe, feeling very sick. While the light was red, I decided to turn on some music, hoping it would calm me down. I got the urge to fiddle with Spotify on my radio screen. I heard a loud beep. The light was green. I hesitated for only a split second and then started going. Suddenly a vehicle went screaming in front of me, a red and white pickup truck. It had to be going 55, if not 65. It was a blur, even though I made some of it out. I screeched to a halt and then, once the truck cleared, completed my turn and immediately pulled into the nearest parking lot, which turned out to be a bank. My kids didn't even notice. Nobody seemed to appreciate but me how close we were to serious trouble. In this area, skeeters in pickup trucks are a real pain. They drive aggressively, fitting the stereotypical mold and often instigate road trouble. My reaction was rage. I wished I could have found the idiot who ran the red light and almost killed me and my kids. We were feet from a rather brutal collision. Exhausted by the time I got home, I disassembled the scythes and put the metal parts in a rust solution. I thought about taking a nap. And that's when the dream came back to me. I remembered the figures. In my waking mind, I had theories on who they were. I read a lot of old Greek poetry and philosophy, so it could just be a coincidence. However, if three Greek gods were indeed discussing my fate in a dream, and one decided to intervene on my behalf, I am grateful. I will find some token of appreciation to give. I am somewhat well known on TikTok, and I keep my DMs open to everyone. One day I received a DM from someone saying hi, so I replied. We talked for a bit, and he said he lived in the Philippines and had been stalking my account for two weeks. I was a little scared but decided to ignore it. Somehow this person got hold of my Snapchat and started messaging me there. Still freaked out, I ignored it, thinking maybe it was a lucky guess since I used the same username for everything. The person, named Franklin, told me he was obsessed with me and liked me way too much. I got scared when he told me he was gay and threatened to kill himself. I politely rejected him and urged him not to harm himself. However, Franklin wouldn't leave me alone, even while I was at school. Desperate, I turned to my friend Ethan for advice. Ethan suggested we put it in the group chat and ask for more advice. He also offered to take over messaging Franklin, pretending to be me, so that I could block Franklin and Ethan could handle it. The plan worked at first, Franklin believed Ethan was me, but eventually Franklin figured it out and got angry, again threatening to harm himself. Both Ethan and I were disturbed by this. 
After school, Ethan texted me saying he received a really disturbing message from Franklin. Franklin had sent him explicit pictures. Furious, I unblocked Franklin and confronted him, explaining that I tried to let him down gently and urged him not to harm himself. Franklin responded with curses, so I blocked him again. Franklin continued to harass Ethan, telling him to relay vulgar messages to me. I was infuriated but tried to let it go, thinking there wasn't much he could do. Then, Franklin found my address and my face. I was terrified and scared to go outside, unsure of what he might do. It's been a week since the incident, and while I'm still uneasy, I think I'm safe. However, Franklin won't leave me and Ethan alone, and we've done all we can. Make the background music no background music. Use a female young British voice for speaker 2. Use a male Australian voice for speaker 1. Use a male middle-aged British voice for speaker 3. Use a male old husky British voice for the narrator. Use a male clear American voice for speaker 4. Use a female clear American voice for speaker 5. Add clean subtitles with outline. Use the best audio available.